All right, there's a, a lot that I would like to address regarding uh, John's opening statement, but with 15 minutes, I'm certainly not even going to be able to come close to, to, to deal with every single point that he raised. However, there were three main texts that he uh, did uh, uh, utilize in his opening statement uh, that I will address. Now, now before I get to that, um, there, there's something that, we, that I must explain first um, uh, uh, that is going to help us to understand the text that he used. And as a matter of fact, the text that he used, his failure to understand what I'm about to present is actually what results in him and others misusing these texts against the sovereignty of God. Now, what is this? My, my subscribers know, uh, so this is going to be nothing new. But in the Word of God, we are taught in, in, in what we call, in theological terminology, we have two different things. We have God's will of decree and God's will of command. They are two separate issues. Okay, um, does the Bible lay it out that clearly? God has a will of decree and he has a will of command. No, but these are things that are deduced from Scripture very easily, very clearly. Just as the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but we can deduce that very easily. Now, a failure to understand this, a failure to recognize this, is what leads people to misunderstand many passages of passages of scripture, but in this case, in, in this context, the three that John brought up. Now, given the fact that uh, what I am asserting is that there is God's will of command, what he tells people to do, and there is God's will of decree, what he actually decrees and determines will de take place. Now, I'm going to use, there, there are many examples that I could use, but I'm going to use the two most well-known, most prominent examples. First one is Exodus 4, 21 and 22. God is speaking with Moses, and he tells Moses, he says, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let the people go. Okay? In the next verse, it says, but I'm going to harden his heart so he won't let the people go. Here we have a perfect example within two verses, verse 21 and 22, where God is commanding one thing, let the people go, and decreeing something else, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart so he won't let the people go. This is very plain, very explicit teaching in Scripture. Also, Acts chapter 2 and 4, where we have the murder of Christ. Now, nobody's going to question that God has commanded people not to murder. It is one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not murder. However, God has decreed, did decree, and predetermined the murder of Jesus Christ. Not only that, God commands us not to sin, period. And it wasn't just the murder of Christ that was sinful. It was everything that led up to that. His illegal trial, the beating of him, everything about him, that prior, those events prior even to the crucifixion was sin. And ultimately it culminated in the crucifixion. So here we have an example where God commands us not to sin and commands us in particular not to murder, but yet he predetermined uh, 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 and foreordained that Herod and Pontius Pilate, the Jews and the Gentiles, would be gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose foreordained to take place. In other words, there was a command, you don't murder, and there was a decree, the murder of Jesus Christ. Now, I know there's a lot of folks with their heads spinning right now, as they always do. They think, well, th 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 you know, then that makes God, you know, schizophrenic or that, you know, some other rhetoric that, that usually comes out of people's mouths. And I'm not saying that's going to be John's argument, but I've heard it a million times. But rhetoric is not refutation. Rhetoric is not uh, a, a rebuttal. Those who, who would argue and say, well, that, you know, this two wills of God thing, it makes him a schizophrenic or, you know, he contradicts himself or something. You have to deal with the text, and that's the problem is my opponents never deal with these texts. They never deal with the examples that I give. You may say that makes God schizophrenic, but does not Exodus 4.21 and 22 say that God commanded Pharaoh to let the people go, and yet he decreed that his heart would be hardened so he wouldn't let the people go? You have to deal with the argument. Rhetoric is not refutation. Um, now, Given this, now that we have an established principle, now we can look at these texts that John brings up. Now we can better understand what is taking place. Jeremiah 32 was his first one. The people were casting their children into the fire. What did God say? He says, I did not command you to do this, 
nor did it enter my mind. Okay, so the argument goes, he didn't command them, thus, or they did it anyways, thus God was not sovereign and his will was not accomplished. No, the text is simply dealing with God's will of command. Yeah, they didn't do his will of command. There's no question. But did they act according to his will of decree? They most certainly did. Now, what we have here also is what's called Hebrew parallelism. Hebrew parallelism is when a state, there's one statement made and then there's another statement made right after it. And the second statement is, is, is parallel to the first statement. It's rephrased or different words are used, but it's, but it's a further explanation of what was said in the first statement. So in this case, what we have is, I did not command you, nor did it enter my mind. Or we can paraphrase it because it's Hebrew parallelism. Not only did I not command you to burn your children in the fire, I never even thought about commanding you to burn your children in the fire. Now, this is a text that is dealing with God's command, not God's decree. Thus, it is an irrelevant text on the sovereignty of God. Let's move on. He brought up the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer um, basically says, you know, uh, that, that your will, he's praying to the Father, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the opponents to my position would argue, you see, if the Lord Jesus is telling us to pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, that necessarily implies that God's will is not being done on earth. Well, let's go back to our principle of decree and command. I fully agree and admit that God's will of command is not being done on earth. That's why people are sinners. That's why people are breaking and violating his commands every day, every moment. But that's what the text is addressing. It's not addressing the, the overarching sovereignty of God and whether or not his ultimate plan decrees and sovereignly working out every detail. That text isn't addressing that. It's addressing whether or not his will of, of command is being done. And it's not. But that says nothing about whether or not he is decreeing and determining and sovereignly, sovereignly bringing about acts of disobedience. Thus, the text is irrelevant to the question. As a matter of fact, what does the Bible say? That God sovereignly rules over all. I, I mentioned Psalm 103 and, and, and Daniel 4. God's rule in heaven rules over everything. He is ju God is just as sovereign on earth as he is in heaven. His sovereignty isn't any different. It's just what is he sovereignly bringing about? In heaven, he is sovereignly bringing about only righteousness. And on earth, he's sovereignly bringing about righteousness and wickedness. Thus, the reason people are violating his will of command. Let's move on to uh, Matthew 23, 37. Uh, a, a common text, uh, but they were unwilling. See, they were unwilling. Thus, they had free will. Thus, God wasn't in control. God's sovereignty wasn't working there. What have you. But the problem with this text is this text doesn't address why they were unwilling. It just gives us a description. They were unwilling. That's great, but does it say their unwillingness was due to free will? Or does it say their unwillingness was due to the sovereign dec decree of God? No, it doesn't say one way or the other. Thus, this text is irrelevant to our debate because it's not addressing the sovereignty of God. It's just giving us a description of what happened. They were unwilling. Fantastic. Now, this leads us to the issue of, of primary and secondary texts or explicit and implicit texts. Now, in my video, <clears throat> my opening statement, I gave you explicit and primary texts dealing with the sovereignty of God. Acts chapter 17, God determines the times and boundaries in which people live. That is a direct, direct uh, uh, verse dealing with the sovereignty of God, okay? And all the implications that go with that. Uh, Philippians 2.13, it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do. Not a sparrow could fall from the sky unless it be by the Father's hand. I, I gave a bunch of texts that were primary texts dealing with the sovereignty of God. And then I gave some implicit texts or secondary texts like Job 14.5 where 
uh, God decrees, determines the day of our death. Now, obviously, in that text, God is obviously sovereign over the moment of our death. Does it necessarily, um, well, I would say that it does necessarily, but it, it's not specifically saying in that text that God is sovereignly controlling everything. However, when we, uh, uh, what we can deduce, necessarily logic, logically deduce from that, as I gave in my opening statement, is that in order for God to do that, to decree when you die, he has to decree how you die, and obviously everything that leads up to it. So in that case, I gave a secondary or an implicit text regarding the sovereignty of God. But each text I gave dealt with the issue of God's sovereignty, whereas um, John you only presented texts that actually had nothing to do with whether or not God is sovereign. They're actually irrelevant to this debate. Now, I know that on the surface, they may appear to look like they're relevant because it says they're unwilling or it says God didn't command them to do this or, you know, your will be done on earth. As I, I, I freely admit that they, on the surface, look like they might be relevant to, to our discussion. However, once you realize that God decrees things and he commands things and they don't always jive, they don't always intersect, that is, as the two examples I gave and many more could be given, that God decrees and sovereignly brings about acts of disobedience, okay? Pharaoh was a perfect example, Herod and Pontius Pilate were perfect examples, and I could give more. So once we understand that principle, we all of a sudden realize that Jeremiah 32 and Luke, I believe it's chapter 12 in the Lord's Prayer, um, and uh, Matthew 23, 37, actually aren't even addressing the subject of God's sovereignty at all. They're not. They were not willing is just giving us a description of their attitude. That's it. It doesn't tell us why they were, were unwilling. And, and then the other two about command, uh, uh, I did not command you to catch children in the fire and your will be done on earth is just making a distinction between what God decrees and what God commands. Those texts are dealing with what God commands, not decrees. Now, for instance, let me give a quick, I only got a couple minutes left, but let me give you a quick example of what I mean uh, with the Matthew 23, 37. When I say that text is irrelevant because it's not telling us why they were, that why they were unwilling, it's irrelevant because it doesn't tell us that. It's just a description. Now, if we want to know why they were unwilling, we can go to other texts. For instance, John chapter 12, verses uh, 37 through 40, 41, something like that, where the Pharisees would not believe on Jesus. It says that they were unwilling to believe, or they would not believe, depending on the translation. And then it says, for this reason, verse 39, for this reason, they could not believe. And then verse 40 gives us the reason for their unwillingness. For God has hardened their hearts and blinded their eyes. You see, that is a text, that is a primary text dealing with the subject of God's sovereignty because it's actually explaining their unbelief. It's explaining their unwillingness. You see, thus it is an explicit primary text dealing with the sovereignty of God, whereas Matthew 23, 37, again, is simply telling us they wouldn't believe. That's fantastic, but it doesn't tell us anything else. It doesn't tell us if it's a result of free will or if it's a result of a predetermined plan. It's silent on this subject, whereas John 12, their unwillingness is attributed to the hardening and blinding by God. There we have an explicit text dealing with the sovereignty of God. Matthew 23, 37 is not dealing with that subject at all. Thus, that text is irrelevant. And again, I would submit that the other two texts, the Lord's Prayer and Jeremiah 32, are likewise irrelevant due to the fact that they're not actually addressing the decrees or sovereignty of God, but only whether or not people break his commands. And we all agree that God, that people break God's commands. Why do they break his commands? Because he has decreed sovereignly that people would break his commands so that, in Exodus chapter 4, so that God's ultimate purposes are fulfilled, sovereignly bringing everything about. Thanks.